Why the Last Man, Volume 4, Safe Word, written by Brian K. Vaughn, and art by Pierre Guerra and Goran Parlov. All right, Volume 4, Safe Word. We got two story arcs in this one. The first one, Safe Word, is all about York. It's a very trippy, weird, psychological, sexual volume. We're going to dive deep on York, psychoanalyze him. Uh, we're going to figure out what is his deal with York's sexual hangups. He's the last man alive. Why is he not banging all these women? And also, why does Yor keep seem to be putting himself into harm's way? So we're going to really understand a lot more about Yor in this story arc. Now, it's a very weird story arc. You're going to be going through the issues and be like, what is going on? But by issue three, it'll all make sense. Okay. The next story arc is called Widow's Pass. And uh, that one is about a, a group of militia women that have weird conspiracy theories about the government, and they're causing a whole bunch of problems for everybody because of it. Nothing I hate more than people with stupid conspiracy theories ruining shit for the rest of us. <laughs> so uh, let's dive into the story for Volume 4, Safe Word. Issue 18, Safe Word, Part 1. We open on a flashback 15 years ago in Cleveland, Ohio. We see a little York is visiting his grandpa in a nursing home. York asks his grandpa, Why are there so many women here? And York's grandpa says, Because women live longer than men. And York asks why? And his grandpa replies, Because they suck all the goddamn life out of us. And York replies, Hmm. Must be cool to be like the only guy with so many girls all over the place. And York's grandpa replies, You crazy? It's hell on earth. Ain't nothing worse than ladies and numbers. Someday, you'll understand. In the present day in Colorado, 355 and Allison are riding all-terrain vehicles and are being chased by some cowgirls. The cowgirls are shooting at them. Allison's wheel gets shot and she goes flying off her vehicle. 355 tells York, to go hide in the woods and she'll take care of Allison. So the cowgirls ask 355, where is that other girl you were with? Referring to York. 355 explains it was just the two of them and their pet monkey here. They're trying to get to Denver so they can get some antibiotics for the monkey. He has a cut on his arm and it's infected. The cowgirls don't care. They think the two of them are the daughters of the Amazon. They've heard of these Amazons mutilating their teats tearing around on motorcycles, stealing food from defenseless women. Allison says that they are not the Amazons, but the cowgirls tell them to prove it by showing their breasts are not mutilated. The cowgirls say, relax, we're not homosexuals, we just want to know if you're telling the truth. York, he decides to do the stupid impulsive thing and he inserts himself into this situation. He holds a knife up to the cowgirl's horse and tells them, Reach for the sky, partners, or I turn Black Beauty here into a prop from the Godfather. 355, exasperated, says, Mother of Christ. The cowgirls respond, Butch, you so much as nick that horse and I'll kill you and your girlfriends. And York replies, What do I care? We breastless Amazons ache for the sweet embrace of Mother Oblivion. <laughs> the cowgirls tell York that he's not right in the head. And York tells them, Last chance, Hand over your weapons to my associates. So York's kind of stupid plan actually works out in this case. The cowgirls hand over their weapons. 355, she then blasts a shotgun in the air and the horse runs off. 355 tells these cowgirls, you've got a two hour walk back to civilization. I'll leave your weapons with the first reputable trading post we pass. And the cowgirls respond, you mean you women ain't Amazons? And Allison replies angrily, Do these breasts look mutilated to you, you ignorant shitheads? As she flashes them. <laughs> and York mutters to himself, Jeez, so much for protecting a lady's dignity. He was trying to stop her from having to flash these women, and there she goes and does it. After some time has passed, York comments that Ampersand is getting worse. He's getting sick from this infection. And 355 tells York that, He's not coming with them to the hospital. Not after the crap he pulled back there. Her and Dr. Mann are going to go to the hospital, and York is going to stay behind. Allison adds, Getting hands on the drugs that we need for our ampersand is going to take patience, diplomacy, and finesse. 
all things that York lacks. 355 is going to get one of her colleagues to look after York while they go to the hospital. One of 355's ex copper ring agents happens to live nearby. 355 has known this woman since she was 9 years old. They were recruited from the same orphanage together. This woman is Agent 711. York, he makes a joke about 711, like the variety store, and 355 replies, 711 was General Washington's codename during the Revolutionary War. Her friend received that codename when she saved the world from nuclear annihilation. So if you so much as make a single crack at her expense, I will rip off your penis with a claw hammer. So we see this cabin in the woods and we see this Agent 711 in person. Her and 355 embrace because they are friends and they talk about various dead colleagues and their past. And 355 makes introductions to the group and 711 is of course shocked to see York a male alive. 711 asks 355, does this have to do with the amulet of Helene? Remember that amulet that 355 is carrying around? To this, 355 says, actually, we should speak in private about that. So they go to talk privately. Now, while York and Allison are alone, York comments that 7-Eleven seems pretty nice. And Allison says that Shri reminds her of one of her exes that dumped me the night before my freaking MCATs. And York... Shocked, realizing that Allison just admitted that she had a previous female girlfriend and she's in fact gay. And York says, Get out! You're telling me we've been traveling with you for a year and I never even figured out that you were, uh, you know. And Allison replies, Yes, well, I suppose we can add Gadar to the extraordinary number of common senses you seem to lack. 355 returns and tells York to stay with 7 Eleven until her and Allison return. 355 also apparently keeps a journal of her travels, and in that journal she wrote various notes about York, and she gave that journal to 7-Eleven. So 7-Eleven, she's read this journal and she knows what she is dealing with with regards to York. So 355 and Allison head off and 7-Eleven invites York inside and shows him her massive collection of books that belong to her late husband. York is in heaven. Remember, he was an English major in school, so he's just geeking out over all these books that she has. Now, 7-Eleven gives York a drink of something, and York has been sipping it this whole time. And then all of a sudden, York starts tripping balls, and he says, I think I'm going to be sick. And 7-Eleven recites a haiku to York and says, The days are long now. Flies born in shit spread new wings. It's your turn to sleep and York passes out. When York wakes up, he is tied naked to a chair and suspended upside down, and 7-Eleven is in some sort of dominatrix-type suit with her nips popping out, and she has a whip in her hands. Issue 19, Safe Word, Part 2. So York is in a drug-induced hallucination and imagines that he is Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. 355 is the Scarecrow and Allison is the Tin Man. York, though, he eventually wakes up, and he asks who she is, and he warns her that 355 is going to beat her when she returns. And 7-Eleven says that she already moved York away to a secure location, far away from her cabin they were in earlier. No one is going to find them. And York says, I don't get it. Aren't you and 355 part of that same stupid club? And 7-Eleven says, we are. But she hints that 355 doesn't know much about the true Culper Ring. She says, that woman has no idea who we truly are. York screams and then starts hallucinating again some more. And 7-Eleven says, what are you screaming about now, faggot? And York asks why she keeps calling him that. He's straight. And 7-Eleven replies, bullshit. I've read 355's journal. You've been the last man on Earth now for months, and you haven't had sex with one girl yet? You haven't even seen pussy! So tell me about the first time you effed another boy. And York replies, I told you I'm not gay, not that there's anything wrong with that. 7-Eleven then whips him, and she tells York, Tell me about your first gay experience, or I bring out the strap-on and you can have another. So York replies, It, it wasn't like that, and... He starts talking about a messed up story from his childhood. 
He was playing in the forest with a friend as a kid. The friend tied him to a tree, and then the kid was supposed to go back to a fort while York tries and escape. But this kid, when he tied up York, he ends up messing with York and doing weird sexual stuff to him. York begins crying when he thinks of this memory in the present day. But York tells 7-Eleven, You happy asshole? You think you discovered my rosebud or something? It was sick kid bullshit. I told my parents I, and I saw a shrink and it's not my secret origin or something. 7-Eleven coyly replies, Methinks she doth protest. Is that why you became an escape artist? So you could get free if something like that ever happened again? Or is it because you like remembering the way it felt? And York in anger says, You want to know the truth? Your hips are huge, you cow! 7-Eleven then injects York with a needle and asks him, Now, why don't you tell me about your first time with a member of the opposite sex? And York, he doesn't want to, but the drugs force him to talk. York tells the story of how he met Beth. They were sophomores in school, and she got dumped by one of York's roommates, and they were friends, and they eventually fell in love. They were going to wait till Beth was on the pill, but one day they just couldn't wait anymore, and they banged, and she told York that he could finish anywhere but not inside of her. So York, he jizzed in a tissue, and then the next morning when he woke up, flies were covering the tissue that he ejaculated into, and it was thrown on the floor there, and York says, it was the most horrifying thing he's ever seen. Dozens of these flies just feasting on my lust, my depravity, my weakness. For months, I had nightmares about maggots crawling up my urethra and nesting in my testicles. And 7-Eleven tells York, Jesus, you have problems. And we see York is now tied down to a bed. And she asks him, do you even like sex, York? And York says, of course. But 7-Eleven asks, but you think it's filthy? And York responds, I don't know. Yes, no. 7-Eleven asks, are you attracted to me, York? And York says, I guess. And 7-Eleven says, a little? And York admits it, okay, a lot. 7-Eleven then says, then why don't you have sex with me? And then York has flashbacks to his childhood, to his dad having the birds and the bees talk with him, to his sister yelling at him about dirty drawings he drew, to a priest talking about sinning, and York responds to 7-Eleven, because I won't have sex with you because I have a girlfriend. 7-Eleven to this says, you think JFK didn't love Jackie? You think MLK didn't love Coretta? Great men fuck around on their women, York. Whether you like it or not, you're the greatest man alive now. And York says that he can't have sex with her. And 7-Eleven says can't or won't because can't is a problem we can deal with. She says, holding a Viagra pill. She tries to shove the pill down York's throat and tells him, The pills can't make you have an erection. They only work if you want to have sex. And something tells me you do. You can try all you want not to think about it, but we know what's on your mind. And York sarcastically says back, The Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man? And 7-Eleven then replies to York, God, enough with the fucking jokes already. You're a child. And York says to her, hey, I'm not the one playing dress up here. 7-Eleven <laughs> tells York, at least I'm not living in denial. I mean, you survived a plague that wiped out nearly 3 billion people. Do you honestly expect me to believe the worst thing you've ever seen is a few bugs referring to York talking about the flies earlier? And York then remembers the first time he came out of his apartment when the plague happened and he got down to the lobby of his building, and he sees a woman crying because her baby died, and all these dead men on the stairwell of the ground. So that was a little bit more horrific than the flies. York gets angry and tells her, fuck you, and 7-Eleven replies, by all means, I'm trying. And 7-Eleven tells York, come on, York, this is your duty, your sperm is mankind's last hope. And York tells her about Dr. Man and the cloning she's working on. And 7-Eleven doesn't believe that Dr. Man is going to be able to pull it off. She says, billions of men have had centuries to make a clone and couldn't. What makes you think one woman will pull it off in a few years? Face it, you're all that we have. And York, he doesn't want to believe it. And 7-Eleven tells York, listen, you're not a bad person. I'm sure you really do want to help save the world. 
but you have to accept the fact that the only way for you to do that is to fuck a lot. It's your destiny, York. It's the one thing you can't escape. And York, he finally breaks down and says, yes, you're right. I'm tired of running from this. I want it. I want the pain to end. I want you, he says, sweating profusely. Issue 20, Safe Word Part 3, the last issue in this first story arc. 7-Eleven asks York, what did you just say to me? And York says, you heard me. I, I, I want you to have sex with me. And 7-Eleven gets off York and says, no. And York is confused and she explains, I'm an agent of the Culper Ring, not your whore. And York, in his continued confusion, asks, but you kidnapped me and tried to give me Viagra. And 7-Eleven replies, And I would have had sex with you, but we both know that that's not what you really want. York asks her, Why are you doing this? And she replies, I needed you to know that you are not always in control. That there are some things even you can't escape from. She cuts through the ropes that were attaching York to the bed. She then leads York over to a pool nearby in this lodge-type room. She then begins to drown York a bit, and then pulls him out and asks him, there's something you're not telling me. Ever since the plague killed every other man, why have you constantly put your own life in jeopardy? And she drowns York some more and continues talking. 7-Eleven then recites entries in 355's journal about all the times York has risked his life stupidly, revealing himself to the gun-toting Republicans and then to the Amazons at the Washington Memorial and then many other occasions. She drowns York some more. 7-Eleven asks York, have you ever contemplated taking your own life? And York tells her to wait, just wait. He wants to stop being drowned, and he begins to tell her the story of when the plague first hit. He went downstairs, and he saw everybody dead in the lobby of his apartment, so he went right back up to his apartment. He stayed there for a few days, listening to the radio about how all the men were dead, and he assumed it would only be a matter of time before he died himself. But three days later, he was still alive, and him and Ampersand, they needed food, so he finally decided to venture outside. Now, York lived in Brooklyn at the time, and it was a ghost town, save for a few dead bodies in the street. York, he saw a female cop lying on the street outside who offed herself, the cop that we saw in issue one, remember? York, he grabbed her gun, and he put it to his head, and he thought about killing himself. But... At the last second, he changed his mind, and he grabbed the gas mask that was in the back of the cop squad car, and he got ampersand, and he decided to go on a mission to find his family and Beth. 7-Eleven asks York, is that why you left, or were you just too much of a coward to pull the trigger yourself? And you knew deep down that if you threw yourself into enough dangerous situations, sooner or later, someone will put a hole in your head for you. York, he talks about the play that he saw in Nebraska. The Last Man, the one that we saw last volume. He explains the way the play ended with the last man killing himself and letting the woman save themselves. And York admits now, it was the perfect ending to the play. It made so much sense. But he lashed out at the woman who wrote the play and made fun of her because... I know what I need to do, okay, but I can't do it alone. So, in a way, he is asking 7-Eleven to kill him, and he says that he wants it. He wants to die. And she says to him, If that's what you really want, and she begins to drown York a final time. She is saying goodbye to York, and York, his head is underwater, and he is trying to embrace the death that will soon be coming over him. He closes his eyes. He sees a vision of a white light and envisions the afterlife. He looks at someone or something and he says, Oh, and right then he has some sort of epiphany and he decides that he wants to live. York, he changes his mind and he fights back and he springs out of the water screaming, Ah, no, I don't want to die. And he pushes 7-Eleven back. And he continues, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And he runs up the stairs of this basement and heads out the door, only to reveal that he was in this 7-Eleven's cabin this entire 
time. She didn't take York miles away, like she said earlier, to some secluded location. And he asks her, what the fuck is going on? And the 7-Eleven replies to York, relax, it's over. And York asks, what's over? And she says, your suicide intervention. She explains that it's called Le Précis de Enfer, a form of aversion therapy developed in a secret meeting between Benjamin Franklin and Marquois de Sade. It's based on the idea that your sexuality and mortality are indissoluble elements of, and then York cuts her off and asks her, what are you? And 7-Eleven explains she is a member of the Culpa Ring, and she gets people where they need to be. This was her decision to do this therapy on York. 355 was not in on this. She read 355's diary and read all the things about York and recognized his symptoms in the diary. And she felt it was necessary to take drastic measures and help York get over his suicide death wish that he unconsciously had. And York asks her, how did she know he had this kind of death wish? Everyone else, they just think I'm dumb and impulsive. Not that I'm not, but how did you know that I... And then 7-Eleven says, Because life is misery, York. You're not the only one who ever wanted to get it over with. The two of them now come to an understanding, and they both apologize to each other for any slights they did against each other while the therapy was happening. York attacking this girl and this girl doing all that stuff to York. York tells her, though, it was incredible. That last time I went under, I saw, and then 7-Eleven stops York and says, The process is based on secrecy. Any epiphanies you may have had during your journey should be kept to yourself. And York asks her, but don't you want to know what I saw that made me want to live? And 7-Eleven says, no, but whatever it was, don't forget it. So what York is talking about is that last time he went under and was being drowned and he almost died when he saw that white light, and whatever else he imagined there, it created some sort of epiphany in him that made him want to live. The next day, or perhaps a few days later, Dr. Mann and 355 in a healed ampersand return, and 7-Eleven and York pretend that they just had a completely normal time, and they totally didn't have a weird dominatrix drug-induced suicide aversion therapy. They all say their goodbyes to 7-Eleven, and the trio head off. Later on that night, 7-Eleven is holding a picture frame of her dead husband, mourning him. And she is visited by a group of three women dressed in burkas. And 7-Eleven asks them, What's with your outfits? Are they supposed to be ironic? And the reply from the burka women is something like that. Listen. We have reason to believe the amulet of Helene may have passed through here already. And 7-Eleven says she has no idea what they're talking about as she reaches for her gun and they tell her don't, but she reaches for it anyway and the woman in burkas shoot and kill her. And as 7-Eleven is dying, she laughs and says thanks. Like York, she also wanted someone to end her life for her. All right, that was the end of the first story arc in this volume. The second story arc, issue 21, Widow's Pass, part one. We are in Queensbrook, Arizona, and we see a mom named Joy. She is the leader of a group called the Sons of Arizona. Yes, that's correct, the Sons of Arizona. She tells her daughter, Leah, that she looks like a million damn dollars. Another woman dressed in an army outfit named Angeline says, You're one tube of Revlon shy of a debutante ball. So this Leah, this girl, is taking part in some sort of ceremony. Her mom, Joy, makes her say why she is here. And Leah recites that she is here to defend the liberty of the citizens of the state of Arizona through education and service. And Joy asks, And as an official member of our brotherhood, who else will you welcome to apply for membership? And Leia says, all men and women, well, just women now, over the age of 16, regardless of um race, creed, so long as they support our constitution. And after the oath, her mom gives her an American flag and she tells her daughter that she was saving it for one of her brother's inductions, but since they're no longer here, she gives it to her daughter. And Joy then asks her, do you swear to do what is right for your beloved state? 
And Leah says, Hell yeah! And her mom adds, Even if... And Leia continues, Even if it means letting the rest of the Union die. And she throws the American flag into the fire. So, these Sons of Arizona are some sort of military group that existed before the plague, but now all the men are gone, so the women are carrying that torch. And the Sons of Arizona group, they defend the interests of Arizona above the rest of the United States government. And we will learn some of their messed up ideology later this volume. We jump over to York 355 and Allison, and they are walking around the Arizona desert. And York asks, What's your favorite weird smell? York says he loves the smell of old drugstore Halloween costumes. 355 likes the smell of mimeographs, and they all make fun of her for being super old. Dr. Mann refuses to answer York's stupid question, and she changes the subject and says that the pygmy shrew just became extinct. They only live a year and a half, and that's how long since the plague hit, so they must all be dead by now. Allison's always a Debbie Downer, man. She says in a few months, the opossums will be wiped out too. Then the rats. And then York interrupts because he sees some dogs and he gets excited. He starts calling the dogs toward them, but 355 fires her shotgun into the air. She says the dogs had human bones in them. They might have attacked them. The trio walks some more and they're walking by these dead road crews of these men. And York, he winces at the sight. This is not the first dead road crew they've walked by. And York wonders, what the hell is wrong with people? Have no women bothered to clean up these bodies and give them a decent burial? All of a sudden, a bald woman named PJ comes running up to them. PJ is an auto mechanic. She lives in the area and she yells to get away from those boys. 355 points her gun at this PJ and tells her to drop it. She asks this PJ who sent her and PJ says that she was just trying to save their life. And Allison asks York, Isn't this the part where you do something stupid? But York, now having a new lease on life after his suicide aversion therapy with 7-Eleven, says, That was the old York. New York avoids the violent femmes. PJ tells 355 that a local militia of psychos, referring to the Sons of Arizona, have rigged corpses up with booby traps to scare away outsiders. And she didn't want to see some good Samaritans get their hand blown off by a claymore. 355 asks her, why should we believe some skinhead? And PJ explains, hey, this haircut is a practical decision, not a political one. Long hair and desert heat don't go well together. And now that the men are gone, hair is pretty much useless at that moment though. PJ notices York and says, is that a dude? York tries to lie and cover up the fact that he's a dude. He says, no, no, it's just allergies. He's a girl. And PJ to this says, okay, that is the worst fake chick voice I have ever heard. And look at your hands. You're totally a dude. And 355 tries to cover up York's bad lying and says, my companion has a hormone condition that makes her look and sound. And Allison just says, oh, give it up, Agent 355. Just tell her the truth. What difference does it make? And then the two of them, 355 and Allison, they start speaking in Pig Latin with each other. And York tells PJ, don't mind them. They do this all the time. I think it's Chinese. And PJ replies to York, all right, now I know you're a dude. That's gibberish. It's like Pig Latin only. Girls know how to speak it. Although I never heard anybody do it that fast. And York, angry when he hears this, says, Oh, what the fuck? You guys told me that was Chinese you were speaking. <laughs> so Allison decides to come clean and she says, Yes, York is, in the loosest sense of the word, a man. We'll tell you the whole story if you have somewhere we can refill our canteens. So PJ invites them to follow her to her garage nearby because she's a mechanic and she has a garage. Now she explains that this militia group called the Sons of Arizona, they believe the federal government is responsible for the plague. So in some kind of messed up protest, they cut Interstate 40 in two and they are blockading it. And with that one act, these eight assholes have single-handedly stopped 80 to 90% of the ground shipments between the East and West. Allison, surprised, says, only eight women are the cause of this? And PJ explains, 
They are eight exceptionally armed women. A dozen Texas Rangers tried to storm their blockade about a week ago, and all but one of them were killed. The survivor told me that they only managed to wound two of these bad guys before her friends were completely wiped out. Allison, she begins freaking out a bit though, and she says, Oh, if Interstate 40 is no longer an option, how the hell are we supposed to get to my backup lab in San Francisco? And PJ asks, why don't you go up through Utah? And 355 says, they tried that, but a massive forest fire is consuming most of the state. And then Allison, becoming more frustrated, says, well, what about the I-10 or the I-8? What if these sons of Arizona women have those roads taken hostage too? And 355 says, well, then we'll just go down through Mexico and come up through San Diego. Allison says they can't waste that much time. It might take a year to do that. And by then, some Amazons will have probably torched everything I used to make my daughter. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop the clock. Did Allison just say that she made a daughter? York says, daughter? You told us the clone you gave birth to was a boy. And 355 says, and this isn't the first time you've suggested otherwise. And then Allison flips out and yells, what, am I being interrogated now? It was a slip of the tongue. You're the one with the secrets, 355. Maybe the militia's right. Maybe your bosses are to blame for this whole goddamn nightmare. And Allison then storms off. PJ tells 355 and York, well, you guys are welcome to stay here the night and tomorrow figure out everything you need to do. So they all go to sleep. York has a ridiculous dream where he's dressed as a viking and he's fighting to save Beth in the snow, fighting skeletons and a monster. York then gets woken up by 355, who tells him that Dr. Man is gone and they need to find her. We see that Allison has wandered off and she has gone directly to the Sons of Arizona. And she puts her hands up and the Sons of Arizona spot her and point their guns at her. And Allison tells them that she wants to try and make a deal. Issue 22, Widow's Pass, Part 2. 355 and York head out looking for Dr. Allison Mann. Meanwhile, PJ is going to give Ampersand a bath. 355 has an idea of where Allison went, and she says she has to go after her alone, and she wants York to stay behind, and York tells her, You're leaving? Last time you pawned me off to some woman, it was strange. And that was one of your friends. We've only known this Kojak back there for a few hours. 355 tells York that if PJ wanted to hurt you, she would have done it already. She is giving York a gun though, just in case something comes up. York thinks she is insane to give him a gun. Now we see Allison has six armed women of the Sons of Arizona pointing guns at her. She tells them that she's a doctor. Her and two friends are trying to get to California for a medical emergency, and she was hoping they would be kind enough to let them pass. The leader, Joy, tells Allison, nobody crosses for free. And Allison says that she wants to barter. The sons of Arizona recognize Allison has an accent from somewhere else. She's not from Arizona like them. Allison says that she heard stories from a mechanic up the road that some of the soldiers here were wounded in a fight and she'd like to offer her medical expertise to the group. And Joy says that those two soldiers passed on. They're, they're dead now. And Allison says that she's sorry to hear that. She wishes she could have arrived earlier. And Joy takes offense to that and says, What the hell kind of difference would you have made? What, did you think that everyone out here is some backwards hick? That we don't know how to dress a wound or give a blood transfusion? I was a nurse manager in an ER for nine damn years, you condescending piece of shit. Joy then hits Allison with her gun, and Allison screams in pain, but she's still standing. And then Joy comments to her daughter Leah about how knocking someone out, even a civvy, is never as simple as it looks on TV. So Joy hits Allison again, and then Allison's on her knees, but she's still not knocked out. And Leah asks, why doesn't she just go down and play possum? And Joy explains that the brain survival instinct is a bitch. It wants your body to stay up and keep fighting. She then lets her daughter Leah have a try, and Leah takes a turn trying to knock Allison out with her gun as well. So York is talking to that PJ, and they're bonding, and PJ is wondering how York and Ampersand survived the plague. She says, is maybe something in your diets with what you eat? York doesn't think so. Him and Ampersand don't really have the same eating habits. York tells PJ about his plan to go to Australia 
and find his girlfriend Beth after they finish what they need to do in California. And PJ explains that she's going to stay here. She's not going to be scared off by these sons of Arizona skanks. She then explains how she came to be in this garage. Her dad owned the garage and was a mechanic, and he wanted her to take over his business, but she ran away to LA to join a crappy ska band, but when she went to LA, she realized everyone was more impressed with her ability to change oil than the fact that she could halfway play bass, so she came back home to Arizona to the garage. She used to think her dad was trying to keep her down by keeping her in the family business, but in the end, she found it empowering that her dad taught his only daughter to be a grease monkey. PJ, she doesn't think the human race will become extinct with this plague that happened. And York to this says, said the T-Rex to the Triceratops. And PJ says, the dinosaurs didn't really die, York. They just evolved into something new. That's probably what will happen to the women. We'll all just turn into birds or whatever. PJ offers York one of her few remaining beers, and York says, no thanks, he's a lightweight, but PJ insists. Back to the Sons of Arizona. They think Allison is hiding something, that maybe she works with the Texas Rangers that tried to shut them down recently, or maybe she works for the Shadow Government, and they are finally moving into phase two of their plan. Inside the tent, one of the women, Angeline, is interrogating Allison, and running all these insane conspiracy theories by her. Angeline says, How did you kill all the men? Was it satellites or measles? Or those little robots in the blood? Nanites, right? Joy thinks maybe the UN hid something in all the porno, but I know that ain't it. My Ernie, he never watched any one of them from this 40 years. <laughs> Just then, 355 reveals herself in the tent and stealthily takes this Angeline down with one of Allison's needles. Allison is happy to see 355. She feels bad though, and she apologizes for having lied to 355 this whole time about the real story with her clone. Allison then explains that the clone baby was hers, and the whole story with trying to clone her nephew was a bullshit sob story she made up for sympathy. She thought 355 was sent to arrest her, and she figured 355 would show mercy if her experiments sounded altruistic. What she gave birth to in the hospital was barely a clone though, was basically just a mess of limbs and organs. Allison continues explaining that her dad back in Japan was close to cloning himself and she wanted to succeed before he did. And Allison thinks that she is a failure and she is worried that she will never succeed in creating a clone. And even if she does figure it out, it will take years, years the world doesn't have. So that was a little interesting thing to learn that Allison's dad was also involved in cloning himself. Anyway, Joy walks into the tent and 355 points a gun at her. Joy, she smiles though. She recognizes 355's gun is government issue, which in her mind confirms her theories that the government is behind this whole plague thing and now they're trying to clean it up. 355 gets closer to Joy and Joy screams for help for reinforcements. 355 then pistol whips her, but Joy's reinforcements charge in. 355 knocks them out, popping one of their eyes out. Damn, was not expecting that eye to pop out. 355 yells, next woman inside this tent is dead. Joy though, she got up and she is now holding a knife up to Allison's throat. And Joy tells 355, you need a lot more than one hit to knock someone out. Now drop your toys or I take her faster than you whores took my sons. Back to York and PJ. They're both drunk a bit now and talking and laughing and PJ asks York, seriously, how have you not boned a girl this whole time? And York, he points to his hand implying that he's been masturbating a lot. He says, there was this one day in Chicago where they stopped by these outdoor showers the city set up. He had himself quite the session that night. <laughs> York also comments that it beats the alternative, he doesn't like the idea of preying on lonely women's desperation. PJ, she kind of respects that. She tells York that he is not the kind of guy that she would have banged before the plague, so it would feel weird to bang him now, it would sort of degrade them both. Just then, York and PJ hear some wild dogs barking outside and going nuts. 
PJ thinks it might be something, so she grabs a rifle and is going to go check it out. York stays back though, and he goes looking for that pistol that 355 gave him. Issue 23, Widow's Pass, Part 3, the final issue in this volume. We see Leah, the daughter of Joy from the Sons of Arizona. Leah is searching the property, and PJ yells at her, recognizing her. And Leah, who is pretty new to this militia stuff, she gets startled, turns, and fires her gun, killing PJ. Leah is kind of shocked that she killed this girl, and she says, Oh shit, that was your fault, bitch. This shit's on you. I didn't want to shoot you, as she is dragging PJ away. She notices York in the window of the garage nearby. York is trying to get Ampersand to be quiet, and Leah runs down to the garage and aims at York and asks him, Who the hell are you talking to? Back to the Sons of Arizona. 355 is now being interrogated by them as well. 355 tells them that she is not a federal agent. Her and Dr. Mann are physicians on a humanitarian mission. And Joy decides to test 355 with a first year nursing exam question to see if she is really a doctor. She asks, all right, Let's say a patient is supposed to get a thousand milliliters of lactated bringer's solution in a five shift. What's the infusion rate? I have no idea what most of that means myself, really. <laughs> 355 answers. 200 milliliters an hour and it's ringer's solution, not bringer's. Even though it sounds like 355 got that question right, they still don't believe her. And Joy spouts more conspiracy theory bullshit about how Bush and Cheney are probably still alive right now, hiding in Mount Weather, waiting to release their shock troops onto them. 355 tells Joy, Stop regurgitating whatever propaganda your husband fed you. There is no war. All this blockade of yours is doing is starving the country. And Joy tosses 355 back in with Allison. Allison comments to 355, 200 milliliters an hour, not bad. 355 replies, what? I got that right? And Allison, surprised, asks, you were bluffing back there? You didn't know? 355 says that her mom used to be a nurse and she'd sometimes make the rounds with her and she must have remembered that factoid. Allison asks her, why have you never talked about your family? And 355 says that her mother, father, and sister all died in a car accident when she was eight. Allison is very sad to, to hear that. We jump back to Yorick. He reveals himself in Ampersand to that Leah girl. Yorick tells her that she seems a little young to be a murderer. And Leah is surprised to see a man alive once again. And Leah defends her actions in killing PJ and says, That chick drew on me, I had to kill her. And Yorick replies, She wasn't a chick, her name was PJ, and she played bass in fixed cars. Now Yorick tells Leah, that he had the opportunity to take a gun with him when he left Brooklyn, but he never thought he might have to defend himself from one of you. Stupid, huh? Back then, I didn't even think women owned guns, but the last few months have been real educational. So they both point guns at each other and are in a standoff. And then we hear two bangs, but we don't see what happened. Back to 355 and Allison. 355 thinks they are probably only five of them outside now. PJ said there were only eight women in the camp, and Joy's kid is on patrol, and two of her soldiers are in the morgue. That leaves five. Allison, though, she she's not even listening to this. She can't get over her guilt of lying to 355 earlier about the clones and stuff. She explains that she lied because she didn't want 355 to think that she was some sort of mad scientist. She admits it was juvenile, but she wanted 355 to like her. And 355 says, I do like you, Allison. But then 355, reading Allison's face, says, Hold on, you mean, like, like, like you? Meaning romantically? And Allison replies, Jesus, you're even starting to talk like Yorick. <laughs> 355 says that she always knew Allison was gay, but never knew she had any interest in her. Just then, they get interrupted by Joy and are led outside. They put a blindfold on Allison. They are going to kill her by firing squad. Angeline asks 355 if she has any last words. 
355 then speaks in Pig Latin really fast, like we saw her and Allison doing earlier. And the sons of Arizona are confused. They don't know what she's saying. But really, 355 is giving a secret message to Allison. And Allison goes down on her knees and bends over, pretending that she might be sick and need to vomit or something. And as she does that, 355 pushes Joy over Allison, making her fall to the ground. 355 then spins around and grabs the gun out of that Angeline woman beside her. And she says to Angeline, I'm sorry. And she shoots her through the bottom of her chin, through her head, killing her. The three other soldiers that were part of the firing squad, they start opening fire on 355. She gets nicked in the shoulder, but she is an expert marksman and she manages to shoot the three soldiers down easily. Joy then grabs Allison and holds a gun to Allison's head, but 355 aims and takes the shot and just misses Allison, nailing Joy right in the middle of her forehead, taking her out as well. All of the Sons of Arizona women are dead. It is over. They are both safe now. Allison asks, is it safe to take off the blindfold? And 355 tells her, no. He doesn't want Allison to see all the death around them. Three hours later, Yorick is burying two bodies, Leah and PJs. Turns out, Yorick and that Leah, they had their standoff and Yorick shot and killed Leah. When Allison and 355 return to him, York decides to lie, and he tells them that PJ and Leah shot each other and they both died, and he was hiding like a coward as it all went down. So York, he wanted to keep that a secret, perhaps struggling with taking his first human life. Now with this diversion behind them, the trio can now continue on their journey. They have opened up the I-40, so provisions can now continue to make their way to people across America, and they are free to head towards California. We jump back to Kansas, to that barn hot suite, with the two geneticists, the pregnant astronaut Siba, and the Russian secret agent Natalia. Natalia is guarding the base. One of the twins comes up to her and tells her that the astronaut Siba successfully gave birth to a healthy, baby boy. That's right, a boy. And her new son is fine. So there is now another male out there in the world besides Yorick. Although the baby is going to be confined to the hot sweet room for now until they are certain the environment poses no threat to him. Just then, Hero, Yorick's sister arrives, walking in the distance, and she says, my name is Hero, and I was wondering if you could tell me where the F my brother is. And with that, we end Volume 4. Alright, so that was Volume 4. I thought the stuff with York and that Dominatrix chick was pretty interesting. I had a fun time with their banter back and forth. I like that we got some exploration of York's psychology and what makes him tick and his sexual hangups and his suicide death wish he had and that is why he kept putting himself into harm's way and now that he has confronted that and realizes that he wants to live he's going to stop trying to put himself into dangerous situations so i think that was some good character development for york although i will say it was definitely a very weird trippy volume maybe a little bit too weird the widow's past storyline wasn't too bad i maybe wasn't as interested in those girls as I was with maybe Victoria and the Amazons and Alter and some of those interactions were maybe a little bit more compelling to me than these uh, militia chicks with their conspiracy theories, but uh, it was still entertaining. Uh, I did like the tease at the end of this volume for some future mystery. So Hero trying to get to York. We also have Siba giving birth to a baby boy. We have Allison Mann admitting that she cloned herself, as well as Allison admitting that her dad was somehow involved in cloning. So uh, lots of mystery there. Also, that 7-Eleven girl <laughs> and uh, those people in burkas, and they killed her. And uh, there seems to be some sort of greater culpering conspiracy going on with that. So lots of mystery, lots of mystery. Uh, I'm going to give this volume an 8 out of 10. Still pretty good, although I did enjoy a few of the story beats in the previous volumes a little bit more, but uh, still a good volume.
Thank you all for watching. I will be back next week with Volume 5.